Okay, so welcome to Intergenerational Politics with Jill Wine-Banks and Victor Shi, where we host weekly political discussions that are engaging and relevant for all generations, tuning in with experts on various issues facing our country today. This is Victor Shi. I'm going to be an incoming freshman at UCLA next year, and I'm also the youngest Joe Biden delegate here in, here in Illinois. Um, Jill, do you want to give us a brief introduction about who you are? Sure. Um, normally, I introduce myself as Jill Wine-Banks, the former Watergate prosecutor and author of The Watergate Girl. But probably more relevant to today's conversation is that I was general counsel of the U.S. Army mm -hmm. and have some experience in looking at that uh, from that perspective, as well as from my DOJ, Department of Justice, law enforcement yeah. experience. So I think those are the things that are probably the most relevant, but also because I was a state um, deputy attorney general of Illinois and can view this from the perspective of having troops, federal troops sent into the state where they aren't wanted and what the state can do, uh, including filing lawsuits to prevent the federal troops coming into cities where they're not wanted. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And as always, we want to thank you for listening to Intergenerational Politics. Today, we are going to be discussing the recent disturbing events involving federal agents from the DHS um, going into the city of Portland, Oregon, and now threatening to come into Chicago, um, which is Jill in my home state. Um, and then we'll also talk about whether this use of federal force is legal and whether it um, is a wise policy and whether it's an appropriate response to some of these protests going around um, after the devastating killing of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and other black lives throughout this country. Today, we are so excited to be joined by Juliet Kayem, um, the former U.S. Assistant Secretary of Homeland Security for Inter Intergovernmental Affairs and a Belfer Senior Lecturer in International Security at the Harvard Kennedy School. I think it's important to note that she was in DHS in the Obama administration yes. mm -hmm. um, and has a very recent experience there. So is a, an ideal expert to be commenting on what's going on now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah, Jill, I'll hand it off to you for uh, to kick off this conversation. So to sort of set the background, I wanna make sure that everyone listening has a proper perspective on what's going on. And we're gonna focus a lot on Oregon and what's happening in Portland. And we are also going to follow up this show, um, which is from a DHS perspective with protesters and uh, city officials in Portland. So stay tuned and come back to listen to that show as well. Um, some of you I'm sure have been following this with uh, great interest uh, because it's it's been just 50 days since George Floyd was murdered by the police. And many cities have had prolonged uh, protests, but Portland has been going almost every night. And um, it's, it's one of the most outstanding examples of citizen participation and speaking out in a way, letting people know how they feel. Um, they're protesting, of course, the police brutality that started all of this and um, racism in general in our country. The majority have been peaceful. Uh, there has been some opportunists who have invaded the peaceful protests and started some vandalism, including um, graffiti on federal buildings and setting fires in contained spaces, not burning the federal building, but having um, containers that are set on fire. Um, and this has led to, um, a assault by the federal government on cities doing what cities do, which is to protect their citizens and to protect peaceful protests. Um, allegedly, it started with federal jurisdiction of protecting federal buildings and the federal courthouse in Portland was uh, vandalized. Um, but we're now seeing that these federal troops are roaming the city going far afield from the courthouse and are pulling citizens off the street. They are unidentified troops driving uh, unidentified vehicles. They're not marked. They're wearing camouflage, looking very military, which is very frightening to me. So Juliet, based on your background at DHS, we want to talk to you about the federal agents who are now in Portland and threatening to come to my city and many other cities as well. 
And are they all DHS employees, as far as you know? As far as we know, so the story, you know, obviously the story is getting funkier, I think is a nice way to put it over the last couple of days. But what we can tell is at least the vast majority of them, although there may be a Department of Justice element with the Marshal Service, the vast majority of them are either Customs and Border Protection, CBP agents, or a small group of, um, or a small agency that most people had never heard of before called the Homeland Security Investigation Unit, HSI. Mm -hmm. These are um, investigators, so they're not operational tactical police officers. Mm -hmm. They're, they are um, intended to be utilized for long-term counterterrorism um, and other sort of homeland security investigations. I mean, so now we're seeing federal and local governments clashing in terms of whether federal troops should be present as well as violence between federal agents and protesters. But in addition, we're also seeing federal agents in camo and without any agency insignia. And these officers um, are using unmarked vehicles to take away protesters. Now, fortunately, there are lawsuits. Um, there's one from Oregon's Attorney General, investigations from the House of Representatives, and litigation from the ACLU underway to challenge the presence of these untrained, unidentified, and unwanted federal agents. And recently, Ken Cuccinelli, who is the acting deputy secretary for DHS, said in an interview, that this topic is barely worth discussion because um, we see these troops all the time with unmarked vehicles and unmarked um, and, and unmarked uh, bodywear. So we also have DHS Secretary Chad Wolf saying yesterday in a press conference of his that he believes these federal officers' uniforms are quote completely appropriate and standard. Um, now, based off of your time in DHS, is he correct based on what you've seen? And if not, why is this happening? The most important thing, though, so so they've been unleashed, so to speak, under the under under a changing legal theory, and I think that shows the fallacy of what's going on. Originally, it was uh, to protect a federal courthouse, which is under the Department of Homeland Security's homeland ambit, not not unlike the Secret Services with uh, with uh, individuals. Um, then it was statutes, uh, statues, sorry, uh, under the new executive order uh, that, that the president passed that, you know, somehow in the middle of a pandemic and, um, and hurricane season and an election that is likely, that is going to, you know, be interfered with, we're going to worry about, you know, dead white male stat, you know, white men, statues of white men. And then, the, and then, though, when he said he was going to do Chicago, L.A., or wherever else, mm -hmm. he said, because uh, the dr drugs and crime, which like, that's like your traditional, you know, under the Tenth Amendment, local and state activity. And I think that's, mm -hmm. I think that, that's, that's the tell, so to speak, that this has nothing to do with supporting local and state capacity, which is what the, what the department is supposed to do. Um, it supports what, you know, when local and state needs um, can no longer uh, either function or can't handle a certain situation. Think of a big hurricane or something like that. Um, and that, that that's the tell to me, that this is just a political move um, against democratic uh, mm -hmm. cities, against cities run by Democrats, to create an aura that they are not being managed well, and that he's the law and order president. And it's you know it will be, it will be litigated, uh, but I you know I'm a lawyer by training. I haven't practiced law in a long time. I'm a tactical operational person, and from mm -hmm. that perspective, this is really I mean this is this is dangerous to put. Yeah not just for the citizens who are protesting, but I worry about friendly fire. I mean, mm -hmm. I, these you don't just overlay a, an armed federal entity onto local state jurisdictions without their, their uh, uh, you know, sort of uh, uh, acceptance, right? It's just mm -hmm. not, it's not how operations work. So I would say another tell might be the fact that they are roaming the city. They were supposed to be protecting federal buildings, which would mm -hmm. be within their jurisdiction, but that's not where they are anymore. So does yeah. that sort of indicate to you another politically yeah. motivated reason? Yeah. There's no, there seems to be no uh, standard operating procedure. There's uh, no rules of engagement. All the stuff that you would do uh, if you had a federal um, uh, law enforcement agency, agents in a street, they're not, they're, 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 they're not investigating anything. And in fact, the, yeah. the acting secretary of Homeland Security, Chad Wolf, um, you know, who, who struts around like he had been the general in World War II and talks about, you know, talks about, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, what, what were his words like something like you know uh, until the mission is complete it's like what right. mission are you talking about like yeah. 
So, and the enemy is defeated. He, this morning, talked about preventative detention. And you're like, um, okay, I haven't practiced law in a long time, but I do remember my constitution. Like that one doesn't, work, you know. <laughs> right. So, um, so I, I mean, I think you know, this is a, a this is a, a, a political move um, of of roaming um, agents who uh, have no mission. And um, and but I do I do think part of this, um, and, and I see you on TV a lot, Jill. So I know you think about this. So, you know, I'm I'm probably more, um, I don't know, I have my moments, but you know, may, you know, I, I do think that the institutions, if, if he loses in November, the institutions can be reformed and rethought mm -hmm. through and, and, and fixed. I don't think that happens after eight years, but I, um, I, I did have my moment though, and I'll tell you when that was, when I thought, you know, we're done. And that was Lafayette. I thought, yeah. um, I yeah. thought, here's a president who's unleashed the military. The military should know better. There's clear rules about the engagement of the military, the rules that I live by because I oversaw the National Guard. So, I mean, I, I you know, you, 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 you've got very, very uh, strong rules and, 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 um, and institutional preferences, right? The military doesn't want this. That night when I saw that happen, I thought, he's not leaving. Like I thought that he's got the military. So I was so pleased at the pushback over the following 72 hours plus um, by, from the Secretary of Defense and the Joint Chiefs and, and Miley and stuff that, that they, you know, and then the internal pushback and then the external, finally, finally Mattis comes out and others that I thought, okay, well, he doesn't have the military, but he does have the Department of Homeland Security because it's, it's weaker, it's newer, its leadership is pathetic. Um, and I say that yeah. as a compliment to Chad Wolf. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and, but that's who he wanted in that department. You've said two things that I wanna follow up on if I can. One has to do with training and the fact that these people are out there. Uh, so let's start with, with that question. Um, what would be the normal training for these yeah. various agents that are out there from these unknown agencies? And even though they're out there now, not wearing uniforms with name tags and identifying the branch they come from, they're wearing camo, which makes it it's look ridiculous. military, which yeah. is yeah. Really bad in my view. And, and um, my experience, I worked in the Pentagon, I was general counsel yeah. of the army. So I know about posse comitatus, exactly. and the inappropriate nature of having a army be involved in any kind of civilian law enforcement and mm -hmm. even making it look like that raises in me horrors of um you yeah. know I'm, I'm i'm old but i'm not old enough to have known firsthand during world war ii but um you know reading a lot about it it makes me really scared yeah. uh, yeah. that we're in a situation where we have authoritarian leadership and uh, it, it's like the Nazis taking people off the street. So what training do they have that might qualify them to be of assistance, even though the mayors don't want them, the governors don't want right. them, they're not being requested except maybe in Kansas. Right, exactly. So th there's there's none. I mean, in other words, so so because the training that you generally get as a first responder is tied to what your mission is. So they are used to working with immigrants, CBP, and HSI is an investigatory unit. So it's not, it, it should have no interaction with the public in terms of crowd control or whatever else. So, and there, and there was, there was a leak that the New York Times reported on that, you know, which, which was just clearly to throw the, the Trump leadership under the bus, which was, you know, people saying these people are not trained to do this. They don't, mm -hmm. they don't know how to interact. And, and the interaction of, as you know, with posse commentators, with, with, with lawful civilian behavior, even if it's protest, that's still lawful, um, is very, very delicate. And it took, you know, I can't say that they're even good at it, but it took decades of, uh, you know, police experience to learn how to interact with uh, uh, civilian uh, protests. And you saw some cities behave very well in, uh, during the Black Lives Matter uh, protests and some uh, others. So, so they should not be there. Um, and I think you're right. I mean, I think 
we have we have the rules for the military, you know, posse comitatus, which is, you know, you know, you, you can utilize the military, but not for law enforcement purposes. There's some exceptions. That exception is the Insurrection Act, which the president constantly threatens but never uses because no one views any of this as an insurrection, right? I, sh I guess yeah. I should have made that clear. There's no reason for this. These are just right. civilian yeah. protests. And then, but then you have this middle ground, which is uh, the Department of Homeland Security Agency, which does have um, operational uh, 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 jurisdiction in the homeland as a, uh, as a law enforcement agency, but not with civilian populations. They tend to be, you know, either VIPs like Secret Service or, immig or, or, or at the border. And so Trump is just sort of pushing the envelope of what anyone would have envisioned DHS's capacities to be. And I, you know, one of the things is I, you know, I worked at that department. I know it's tremendous flaws. I know a lot of people want to get rid of it, but it's not, but, you know, the, the president has abused its, his power with DOD and with DOJ and with the education department, like that he's now turned to DHS. It should not be a surprise to us, right? It's not intrinsic to the mission of Homeland Security that this has happened. It's intrinsic to the mission of Donald Trump that this is happening. Exactly. And you just used the word lawful again, which is my, the second part I wanted to follow yeah. up on because when you quote um, Secretary Wolf saying things like the enemy, yeah, these are peaceful protesters. Yeah. Yeah. Now there is there seems to be perhaps an element that has invaded the peaceful protests that has created vandalism and including of a federal building. That seems to me would be within DHS's normal jurisdiction to protect the building. But rounding up people and pulling them off the street into unmarked cars seems far afield from that. Yeah. And this attitude of they're the enemy goes to what an authoritarian dictator would I think, think. That's right. And this makes uh, Wolf the equivalent of Barr, uh, who's yeah. now yeah. acting as the personal attorney for the lawyer instead of the people's attorney, and not taking care of what I would consider to be his real job. Right. So um, what what can we I mean, do? I, yeah. What do I do? I mean, I, you know, I think, um, uh, well, I think litigation helps. I think the, the public pushback. I mean, I love that the moms came out. You know, yes. they, they call the suburban moms. And now dads are coming out too. Yeah, now dads. Yeah. I mean, the thing that I, you know, and I, I, I often wonder, like I, you know, I'm not a pollster and I don't do politics for a living, but I, but I do do security for a living. And, and I often wonder like who the hell, sorry, who the heck is <laughs> Donald Trump's pollster? Because I know my book is called Security Mom. Like I wow. know the security moms, like the suburban moms who maybe irrationally worry about security. And between <sighs> between Trump pushing opening schools, right, and and then this, yeah. right, wh who's telling him that like the 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 white suburban female vote likes this? Like I mean, it's they 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 they're they're, they're overly cautious about their kids. And they're out protesting, you know, against the administration. So look, I mean, I'm in the, you know, you, I'm in the, it's going to get worse, but then it's going to get better phase. I mean, obviously Biden doesn't win in November. We're all going to want to like walk to Canada. We're going to like be knocking on Canada's right. door. But um, which is, you know, people like Wolf have no other game plan. Um, th they know I mean, I'm thinking really like tactically. So what's what's Chad Wolf's exit strategy if Trump, Donald Trump loses? It is to be embraced by the Trump world so that he has a safe landing. It, he can't pivot now, like just as a purely sort of tactical self-interested. So he's going full silliness. I mean, I know I shouldn't laugh at it, but like... He's ridiculous. He's a lobbyist and he gets on there TV or he has his like Twitter handle, which he like now he's like half shaven with aviator glasses. And you're like, <laughs> or, like, like you're, you're a bureaucrat. Like it's yeah. just ridiculous. And so, um, so it is, I mean, these guys are going for broke because they don't have anything else to rely on. And so all that we can do is just like transparency, get out on the streets, push back. Cause he, I mean, even in the Fox interview he did this morning, like even the host, like this is Fox and Friends, was like slightly incredulous at the way he was talking. And I was like, okay, if you've lost Fox and Friends, you know. Right, so it's gone. He, he did say, one of the things he said was that the troops were there because of, and I'm gonna quote, violent criminal activity and a lack of action on the state's part. 
Um, but that isn't really a legal no. justification mm -hmm. for DHS sending no. in troops. No, the only, that's exactly right. So the only justification, um, uh, uh, so let me put, the, the really bad thing about this is during both the second part of the Bush administration after Katrina, so I'm going to give credit across, so we learned a lot at DHS, it has such a bad reputation, but we did learn a lot, and then over Obama was that you can't have a Department of Homeland Security that's not fully integrated with the needs and priorities of the homeland. Like you can't have this overlay because it won't work, you have 10th Amendment issues, you have legal issues, you have operational issues. And so we spent a lot of time, both after Katrina, in which the, the, the um, department was reformed, laws were changed, um, and then in the Obama administration, um, in a really much more sort of coordinated, what we call unity of effort. You don't call it chain of command. There's no chain of command. Governors do not report to the president. You call it unity of effort, um, and you try to integrate. So this has sort of blown that whole philosophy out. I think most mayors and governors see it for what it is, which is just a more Trump tactic than a DHS tactic. But there is no legal justification. But, but that's the point. DHS is now yes. just another arm of the campaign. Of him. Of him. And, right. But let me just stop you for a second. Much more, much more willing than the Pentagon, I think. The, uh, yes. Yeah. The, thank heavens, I, you're absolutely right that I was so relieved when it was announced that this was a mistake that we participated, we should not have been there. Uh, yeah. But it, I just wanna stop you for a second and say, um, while I know what you're talking about with the 10th Amendment, I wanna make sure that all yes, of our listeners you. do. So could you just uh, explain why you're referring to the 10th Amendment? So, I mean, this is, I often say, so I teach, I'm a professor at the Kennedy School, so at Harvard, so I teach, so my first line in my Homeland Security class is, you know, the challenge of homeland security in America is not the security part. We know how to do that. It's the homeland part. We are a governance system, a constitutional architecture uh, that, um, that, uh, that um, uh, uh, gives uh, the powers of public safety, public health, um, to, through the 10th Amendment is delegated to the state. So governors and mayors have much more control over um, the, for rightful reasons, over their own communities. And so you're, you're constantly, so we, we delegate, the Constitution delegates those authorities. The, and so that's why in Homeland Security, our general motto is locally executed, state managed, federally supported. Yeah. That's what you do, right? And this is what they failed to, or are failing to do in COVID. They're at war, you know, they're also in the COVID response. They're also at war with the states. Like, how is this helpful? Like, this yeah. is crazy. So that's basically what the 10th Amendment envisioned. It's an architectural challenge, but it's also architecturally good, right? I mean, in the sense that, um, yeah. But it also is something that the Republicans normally are strongly in favor exactly. of states control states rights yes. smaller federal government except right now when they want the federal it's government to be completely in charge and that's uh, to me that's extremely dangerous but yeah no that's um, like i mean that's i i tweeted out as like how am i a state's rights advocate during right. a republican administration i'm a progressive democrat like you know like we you know but it is it's crazy and and so another big issue seems to me to be that the places that these federal troops are being sent are primarily democratic right. cities. And it seems to be a real attempt to, I don't know, create this law and order message or to take over in some way that is really um, dangerous and bad and very politically motivated. Yeah. So if we look at that aspect, doesn't that also just say to you, this is not yeah. a legitimate use of DHS? Yeah, exactly. No, it's a, it's it's the tell. It is it is trying to, you know, and and the I think the nerve wracking thing is, you know, will he apply this to uh, to the voting day, right? And that, um, which I think you have to assume that that he'll try and that there'll be some uh, agreement at pe by people at DHS to do this, and then, you know, when he loses, I mean, you know. I'm not worried he won't leave if he loses, but I am worried that he's gonna use every tool at his disposal to make sure he doesn't lose. I agree with you on that. Um, um, and I, I just, I wanna go back to this training issue just to make a comment, which is, it seems like the same problem that the 
police are having, which is that they aren't really trained to deal with uh, domestic disputes and um, they need different training. And so this call to have, for example, social workers respond instead of armed police. And now we've upped the armed and the military looking response, uh, which seems to me completely going in the wrong direction. And we've learned nothing from the protests. So mm -hmm. that's, that seems to be a problem. But since the cities don't want them there anyway, um, yeah. let's talk about what cities can do or states can do to say, don't come here, we're, we're gonna get rid of you. And so far, no one I've heard talk has come yeah. up with something that says, legally, this is what you can do. The um, Attorney General of Oregon has done a lawsuit. The ACLU has filed some litigation. Um, there's talk of arresting these troops yeah. for violating people's civil rights. Now, of course, normally the Department of Justice would be bringing civil rights cases, and not states. But in this case, it's the civil rights being violated by the federal government. Right. So what are your thoughts, um, both as the DHS employee, yeah. former employee, a former official, and as a lawyer, what, what can we tell states, here's how you can protect your people from things that everyone who's on the ground says is uh, exacerbating the situation, right. making it much worse. It's not helping. It's making it worse than when the police were handling this. Well, I think there's a multiple tactics. I, I don't think there's one solution. I mean, obviously, I think that the litigation helps just simply because it keeps the focus on what's going on. And maybe a judge would do an injunction or something or, or limit limit where they're allowed. You know, you're only allowed within a, you know, you know, they're only allowed to roam within 100 feet of a federal courthouse. Um, I think the judiciary could speak up a little bit. I was surprised that you did not hear, you know, um, I mean, I know they don't like to get political, but on the other hand, <laughs> they're not seeking this and the judiciary has a marshal service that is intended to protect the judges. I think third, um, what you want is you want governors and mayors uh, uh, providing no operational planning to these feds so that they literally are just loitering. And then what I would do is I, if I were a mayor, I would get a whole bunch of cameras and just follow these guys and under authority of the uh, public authority rather than you know, the stuff we're seeing on iPhones and stuff, and literally just monitor it as you would any other, uh, you know, uh, public thing. And basically shame these guys. I mean, one of the reasons why they're not, you know, you don't see, they don't have uh, emblems is, you know, they should be embarrassed. Like individually, they should be embarrassed, right? Um, uh, and it's amazing that they're not, or more aren't. You know, I thought this during the, during the um, child separation, you know, you'd hear all these stories about, how heart-wrenching it was for CVP and what they were doing. I was like, why is no one quitting? I don't understand that, yes. you know? Well, With you have sure. to ask that question about a lot of people in this administration is, have they mm -hmm. no moral sense? Why are they not quitting? You're right in terms of separating families, caging children, and now acting in this way. Um, the problem is at the top, no one feels shame. Yeah. Donald Trump sets a uh, model for I can do anything and get away with it. I can shoot someone on Fifth Avenue and get away with it. And apparently now he can get away with shooting unarmed protesters. Yeah, um, so you know, and I think I think that's right. And I think the but the one thing I'll leave on a hopeful note before I have to get on my radio show. Uh, the one thing I will say is um, I think Lafayette. I think if 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 he's out in November, the moment in which Many people realize, you know, he was the Wizard of Oz in some ways and that we've known in a long time. I think Lafayette will be viewed as this moment in which shame came back to the American public. And I really, I mean, because I told, as I told you, I did not sleep that night. I thought I've been too optimistic, right? You know, I, I hear people on Twitter, you know, talking about totalitarianism. And I'm like, you know, he's rough, but, well, you know, the system will hold. And, and the pushback, and I think that's really important. And I think, you know, part of it is also on the racism stuff. So the Confederate flag and stuff, like the Pentagon has essentially overruled the president. In most democracies, we'd be like, that's really disconcerting. Now we're like, thank God, right, on the flag. Yeah. Like shame is returning, right? In other words, 
we're going to call this out and I, we just need to keep it up for a few more months. So mm -hmm. I like that. Mm -hmm. So my last question um, to help our audience and young generation specifically understand DHS and what its proper role should be in our government. Um, my generation is particularly concerned about um, what we're seeing in DHS being used by the president to almost replicate the violence and authoritarian tactics of Hitler and Xi Jinping, who is the dictator in China, by sending federal troops into cities to, quote, restore law and order, even though these mayors, such as Lloyd Lightfoot um, and the Portland mayor, hold, you know, there's no rioting and there's no need for their presence. So it's funny because I remember his remarks last year in June of 2019 supporting Xi Jinping, clearly a dictator, when he said, quote, the Chinese government during the Tiananmen Square protests put protesters down with strength. That shows you the power of strength. Our country right now is perceived as weak, as being spit on by the rest of the world. And now it looks like Trump is approving these types of military tactics used by used during the Tiananmen Square protests and making use of his DHS troops to look like some sort of you know, secret police that we read about in history class, um, you know, about Nazis and the brown shirts and the black shirts from World War II. Now it seems like we're living in a moment that parallels that horrific situation from World War II and confirms many of the concerns that we as young people have with the police and military brutality in this fight for racial justice. So I think that is why some young people are calling for the removal of DHS. So what would you say about the current state of DHS and for those who are calling to get rid of it, um, why is it still a critical department despite these disturbing decisions? So this is not the proper use of DHS. So, so, so people are asking me about this. I was like, you know, this is like asking, you know, can you explain why DOJ pardoned Roger Stone? You're like, they weren't supposed to, right? I mean, in right. other words, some of this is just so corrupt that all you say is this is not the core function. And then I'll end with this. I still believe that there should be a Department of Homeland Security. I hate the name. It should have been called yeah. Department of Domestic Preparedness, the De Department of Civil Defense. Though That was the terminology that someone like me grew up in, which is how do you minimize the risk to a domestic society, knowing that the rules are different um, here than they would be abroad, right? So uh, then if we were fighting a war abroad. Um, and they changed the name to this horrible name. So part of it is I changed the name. But the other is almost every democracy has an entity that is focused on the particular threats that the homeland, but just call it domestic, uh, would encounter. And in particular, because so many threats that we're facing in the 21st century mm -hmm. are non-border, th are, are borderless threats. In other words, mm -hmm. Pentagon gets China and Iran and North Korea, right? That, mm -hmm. So, but when you think about the, the four borderless threats that I'm most worried about, whether they're supported by state or not, and most instances are not, they're a pandemic, of course, which, you know, DHS has sort of written off its role in this. They're um, a pandemic, climate change, radicalization slash uh, terrorism and cyber, right? Cyber attacks in particular on a critical, on our domestic critical infrastructure, which is not a military thing. Most of our critical infrastructure is, not, is we, we're, we're not a socialist country, is 90, like 82% is owned by the private sector. So you can't have, you know, you can't say it's a war. It's just a very different dynamic. So I'm still in defense of the department. I would change its name and I would do exactly what we're going to need to do with DOJ, you know, ODNI, the Department of Education, the State Department. It needs to be fixed after this president. Yeah, it needs I, better leadership. Yeah, and exactly. Thank you. We hope yeah. you'll come. Thank you, so thank you guys so much. Sorry, thank my you. my WGBH calls. Okay, I'll talk to you soon. All right, bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Talk to you later. Thanks. For those of you who follow hashtag Jill's Pin, I want you to know that today is getting close to 100 days to the election, and so I am going to be wearing primarily blue pins to encourage you to vote blue. And today's pin is a blue pin that says vote 2020. Yeah. Democracy depends on your voting. And no matter who your candidate is, and I hope it's Joe Biden, you must vote. It's really, really important. And Victor and I will be doing a show about why you should be voting for Joe Biden. Mm -hmm. Yes, for sure. And we hope that um, you also enjoyed this episode with Juliet. Um, be sure to follow us on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and all podcast streaming services to support our podcast and to listen to our future podcasts because we do have some exciting installments, as Jill said. So thank you for listening and see you in our next episode.